Hello friends and welcome to my channel. In this video, we will be learning about the anatomy of the scalp. To begin with, the scalp is the anatomical area bordered by the human face in front and by the neck at the sides and the back. The soft tissues covering the cranial vault form the scalp. Now let's look at the extent of the scalp. Anteriorly, it extends up to the supraorbital margin. Posteriorly up to the external occipital protuberance and the superior nuchal line and on each side up to the superior temporal lines. Looking at the extent of the scalp more clearly, anteriorly the scalp extends up to the supraorbital margin. Here is the supraorbital margin. Posteriorly the scalp extends up to the external occipital protuberance and the superior nuchal lines and on each side it extends up to the superior temporal line. Now let us learn about the structure of the scalp through this diagram. The scalp is made up of 5 layers as you can see here. First is the skin, then the superficial fascia that is the connective tissue. The third layer is the deep fascia that is the epicranial aponeurosis or the galea aponeurotica with the occipitofrontalis muscle. Then comes the loose areola tissue and the pericranium. These five layers can be remembered by using the mnemonic scalp. Before we learn about the five layers of the scalp in detail, let us concise the points that we have learned till now. The soft tissues covering the cranial vault form the scalp. The extent of the scalp anteriorly is up to the supraorbital margin. Posteriorly it is up to the external occipital protuberance and the superior nuchal lines. On each side it is up to the superior temporal lines. The structure. Scalp is made up of five layers. The mnemonic for it is scalp. First is skin. S stands for skin. Then C stands for the connective tissue that is the superficial fascia. A stands for the aponeurotica that is the deep fascia or the epicranial aponeurosis or the galea aponeurotica with occipitofrontalis muscle. Then comes L that is the loose areola tissue and finally P that stands for pericranium. Now let us learn about the first layer that is the skin in detail. The skin is thick and hairy. It is adherent to the epicranial aponeurosis through dense superficial fascia. It has more number of sweat glands and sebaceous glands. Now let us learn about the second layer that is the subcutaneous or the superficial fascia. It is more fibrous and dense in the center than at the periphery of the head. It contains many blood vessels as you can see in blue and red right here. It binds the skin above to the epicranial aponeurosis below. It provides a proper medium for the passage of vessels and nerves to the skin above. Now before we learn about the third layer of the scalp that is the epicranial aponeurosis, let us learn about the occipitofrontalis muscle. The occipitofrontalis muscle has two bellies the occipital or the occipitalis and the frontal or the frontalis. Both are inserted into the epicranial aponeurosis. The occipital belly of the occipitofrontalis muscle is small and separate. They arise from the lateral two-thirds of the superior nuchal line that I had shown you earlier. It is applied by posterior auricular branch of the facial nerve. Looking at the frontal belly of the occipitofrontalis muscle, they are longer, wider and partly united in the median plane. It arises from the upper eyelid and the forehead. It is supplied by the temporal branch of the facial nerve. The occipitofrontalis muscle raises the eyebrow and causes horizontal wrinkles in the skin of the forehead. Now let us learn about the third layer of the scalp that is the epicranial aponeurosis or the galea aponeurotica. It is freely movable on the pericranium along with the overlying and adherent skin and fascia. Anteriorly it receives insertion of the frontalis muscle and posteriorly it receives insertion of the occipitalis muscle. On each side it is attached to the superior nuchal line and these first three layers of the scalp are called the surgical layers of the scalp or the scalp proper. Looking at the third layer that is the epicranial aponeurosis in this diagram, it is freely movable on the pericranium along with the overlying skin and fascia. 
Anteriorly it receives insertion of frontalis and posteriorly occipitalis. On each side it is attached to the superior nuchal line and the first three layers of the scalp are called the surgical layers of the scalp or the scalp proper. It is the skin, the superficial fascia and the epicranial aponeurosis. Now before we move on to the last two layers of the scalp, let us concise the points that we learned under the skin, the superficial fascia and the deep fascia. So under the skin we learned that it is thick and hairy. It is adherent to the epicranial aponeurosis through dense superficial fascia. It has more number of sweat glands and sebaceous glands. Then under the subcutaneous or superficial fascia, we learn that it is more fibrous and dense in the center than at the periphery of the head. It contains many blood vessels. It binds the skin to the subjacent aponeurosis and it provides proper medium for passage of vessels and nerves to the skin. Under the occipitofrontalis muscle, we learn that it has two bellies, occipital or occipitalis and frontal or frontalis. Both are inserted into the epicranial aponeurosis. Looking at the occipital bellies, it is small and separable. It arises from the lateral two-thirds of the superior nuchal line. It is supplied by the posterior auricular branch of the facial nerve. Looking at the frontal bellies, it is longer, wider and partly united in the median plane. It arises from the skin of the upper eyelid and the forehead and it is supplied by the temporal branch of the facial nerve. The occipitofrontalis muscle raises the eyebrows and causes horizontal wrinkles in the skin of the forehead. Under the epicranial aponeurosis or galea aponeurotica, we learn that it is freely movable on the pericranium along with the overlying and adherent skin and fascia. Anteriorly, it receives insertion of the frontalis. Posteriorly, it receives insertion of the occipitalis. And on each side, it is attached to the superior nuchal line. The first three layers of the scalp are called the surgical layers of the scalp or the scalp proper. Now, let us look at the fourth layer that is the loose areolar tissue or the loose connective tissue. It extends anteriorly into the eyelids because the frontalis muscle has no bony attachment. We had already seen the frontalis muscle earlier. Posteriorly, it is attached to the highest and superior nuchal lines and on each side to the superior temporal lines. It gives passage to the emissary veins that you see right here which connect the extracranial veins to the intracranial veins or the intracranial venous sinuses. Finally, looking at the fifth layer of the scalp, there is the pericranium. It is loosely attached to the surface of the bones but firmly attached to the sutures. Concising the important points under the loose areolar tissue and pericranium, the loose areolar tissue is the fourth layer of the scalp. It extends anteriorly into the eyelids because frontalis muscle has no bony attachment. Posteriorly, it extends to the highest and superior nuchal lines and on each side, it extends to the superior temporal lines. It gives passage to the emissary veins which connect extracranial veins to the intracranial venous sinuses. Finally, there is the pericranium which is the fifth layer of the scalp. It is loosely attached to the surface of the bones but is firmly adherent to their sutures. Now, let us learn about the arterial supply of the scalp. In front of the auricle, the scalp is supplied from before backwards by the supratrochlear artery right here, by the supraorbital artery and the superficial temporal artery. The first two arteries are the branches of ophthalmic artery which is in turn a branch of the internal carotid artery. The superficial temporal artery is a branch of the external carotid artery. Now behind the auricle, the scalp is supplied from before backwards by the posterior auricular artery and the occipital arteries, both of which are branches of the external carotid artery. The scalp has a rich blood supply derived from both internal and external carotid arteries. Concising the important points under the arterial supply of the scalp, in front of the auricle, the scalp is supplied from before backwards by the supratrochlear, the supraorbital and the superficial temporal arteries. The first two are branches of the ophthalmic artery which is in turn a branch of the internal carotid artery. The superficial temporal is a branch of the external carotid artery. Behind the auricle, the scalp is supplied from before backwards by the posterior auricular and occipital arteries, both of which are branches of the external carotid artery. The scalp has a rich blood supply derived from both internal and external carotid arteries. Now let us move on to the venous drainage of the scalp. The supratrochlear and supraorbital veins unite at the medial angle of the eye forming the angular vein that you see right here which continues down as the facial vein. The superficial temporal vein 
descends in front of the tragus, enters the parotid gland and joins the maxillary vein to form the retromandibular vein that you see right here. This retromandibular vein divides into two divisions. The two divisions are the anterior and posterior divisions. The anterior division of the retromandibular vein unites with the facial vein to form the common facial vein which drains into the internal jugular vein right here. The posterior division of the retromandibular vein unites with the posterior auricular vein to form the external jugular vein which ultimately drains into the subclavian vein right here. The emissary veins connect the extracranial veins with the intracranial venous sinuses to equalize the pressure. These veins are valveless. The extracranial infections may spread through these veins to the intracranial venous sinuses. Now as you can see in this diagram, these are the diploid veins. The frontal diploid vein emerges at the supraorbital notch to open into the supraorbital vein. The anterior diploid veins right here ends in the anterior deep temporal vein. The posterior temporal vein ends in the transverse sinus. And finally, the occipital diploid vein opens either into the occipital vein or the transverse sinus. Concising the important points under the venous drainage of the scalp, the supratrochlear and supraorbital veins unite at the medial angle of the eye forming the angular vein which continues down as the facial vein. The superficial temporal vein descends in the front of the tragus, enters the parotid gland and joins the maxillary vein to form the retromandibular vein. This vein divides into two divisions. The anterior division of the retromandibular vein unites with the facial vein to form the common facial vein which drains into the internal jugular vein. The posterior division of the retromandibular vein unites with the posterior auricular vein to form the external jugular vein which ultimately drains into the subclavian vein. The emissary veins connect the extracranial veins with the intracranial venous sinuses to equalize the pressure. These veins are valveless and extracranial infections may spread through these veins to the intracranial venous sinuses. The frontal diploic vein emerges at the supraorbital notch and open into the supraorbital vein. The anterior temporal diploic vein ends in the anterior deep temporal vein. The posterior temporal diploic vein ends in the transverse sinus. And finally, occipital diploic vein opens either into the occipital vein or the transverse sinus. Looking at the lymphatic drainage under two points, the anterior part of the scalp drains into the preauricular or the parotid lymph nodes and posterior part of the scalp drains into the posterior auricular or mastoid and occipital lymph nodes. Now finally, let's learn about the nerve supply of the scalp. The scalp and the temple are supplied by 10 nerves on each side. Out of these, Five nerves, that is four sensory and one motor nerve, enter the scalp in front of the auricle, right here. And remaining five nerves, which also include four sensory nerves and one motor nerve, enter the scalp behind the auricle. Now let's look at the five nerves in front of the auricle. First, let's look at the four sensory nerves. So first there is the supratrochlear nerve that you see right here. It is a branch of the frontal, that is the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve. Second, we have the supraorbital nerve right here. It is also a branch of frontal, that is the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve. Third, we have the zygomaticotemporal nerve that you see right here. It is a branch of the zygomatic nerve, that is a maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve. Fourth, we have the auriculotemporal nerve, which is a branch of the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve. And finally, we have the one motor nerve, which is the temporal branch of the facial nerve right here. Now, let's look at the remaining five nerves behind the auricle. So, let's look at the four sensory nerves. First, there is the posterior division of the greater auricular nerve. Then, there is the lesser occipital nerve, the greater occipital nerve and the third occipital nerve. And the one motor nerve is the posterior auricular nerve right here. Now concising the important points under the nerve supply, the scalp and the temple are supplied by 10 nerves on each side. Out of these 5 nerves, that is 4 sensory and 1 motor, enter the scalp in front of the auricle and remaining 5 nerves, again 4 sensory and 1 motor, enter the scalp behind the auricle. Now in front of the auricle, let's look at the sensory nerves. The supratrochlear, which is a branch of the frontal, that is the ophthalmic division of trigeminal nerve, 
the supraorbital nerve which is a branch of frontal that is the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve again. Then there is zygomatico temporal nerve which is a branch of the zygomatic nerve which is a maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve and there is the auricular temporal branch of the mandibular division of trigeminal nerve and the one motor nerve is the temporal branch of the facial nerve. This comprises the five nerves in front of the auricle. Finally, about the five nerves behind the auricle, we have the four sensory nerves, the posterior division of the great auricular nerve, the lesser occipital nerve, the greater occipital nerve and the third occipital nerve and the motor nerve is the posterior auricular branch of the facial nerve. I hope you found this video helpful. To get the notes of scalp as well as notes of other topics of anatomy, physiology, biomechanics, psychology, pathology and pharmacology, visit my Instagram page, the link to which is given in the description below. To get updates on my latest videos, click on the subscribe button. To get notifications, tap on the bell icon. Thank you for watching.